if you have your schedule, uh, you see that the title of this morning's message is Forgiveness, a Prerequisite for Heaven. Now, when you think about a prerequisite, how many of you all have went to college? Who has their degree? All right. Now, when you went to college, you went for a certain course of study. It didn't matter what it was. You went for a certain course of study, and then you had to go through some various courses that you had to take, but there was something called prerequisites. And the prerequisites you took, it might have been art, music, some type of physical education, something. There were prerequisites that you had to take in connection with your degree for you to obtain the degree. Now, what if you didn't take the prerequisites? Would you, would you have gotten your degree? Even though you, you did all your studies in biology or, or in law or whatever it was, would you have gotten your degree? So as small as the prerequisite really is on the scale of what your life will be, you needed it for you to get the degree. And saints, I believe that forgiveness is a prerequisite for us to get into the kingdom of glory. It is something that we have to learn to walk through. As a matter of fact, a story is told by the Protestant evangelist Chuck Swindoll. And he tells a story about a seminary student in Chicago who had to face a forgiveness test. Although he preferred to work in some kind of ministry, the only job he could find was, a, was driving a bus on Chicago's South Side. One day, a gang of tough teens got on board and refused to pay the fare. After a few days of this, the seminarian spotted a policeman on the corner. He stopped the bus and reported this gang of young teens. The officer made them pay. But then he got off the bus. And as soon as he got off the bus, the gang robbed the seminarian bus driver and beat him severely. He pressed charges and the gang was rounded up. They were found guilty. But as soon as the jail sentence was given, the young Christian saw their spiritual need and felt pity for them. So he asked the judge if he could serve their sentences for them. The gang members and the judge were dumbfounded. It's because I forgive you, he explained. His request was denied, of course. But he visited the young men in jail and led several of them to Christ. Now. This individual right here faced a forgiveness test. He was severely mistreated. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been hurt by someone? Has someone ever hurt you? you know, let's even be a little bit deeper than that. Have you ever been injured by someone? Now, I'm not talking about just simply somebody does something that, that you don't like or it, it made you feel bad. I'm talking about injury. I'm talking about deep. I'm talking about things that actually have shaped your thought process about yourself, even about life. I'm talking about really being injured. Have you ever been injured by someone? You see, this is the thing. That if you have not been injured by someone in that in that way. Before you go into glory, somebody is going to test you and try you on that. And all of us are going to face this thing here called forgiveness. I myself, I have had to face this many times in my few years of life. And I, undoubtedly, I'm not the only one that can say I've had, that they have had to face that issue as well. But what we want to do is, is, is to see, okay, why is this thing so important? Why do I have to work through these issues? Why do I have to make this, this grace evident in my life? Why do I have to do that? 
And I believe it is a gospel issue, that's why. I believe it is core to the gospel. It is core for us as believers. I believe it is a prerequisite before we go to heaven. With that being said, let's go to our keynote verse right now, found in the book of Luke, Luke 17. And what's interesting about this verse right here, when I was given the list of verses, or I was given a theme and the list of verses to consider, I saw the theme and, and I had just been reading this verse that morning when I got the, the letter or the, the document that, said, that had the theme on it. And I was like, oh man, I just saw this this morning. And, and I combed through the verses, but I didn't see the verse then. And I was like, oh man, well, I, I guess I just won't go, th go through with it. And something was like, man, go back and read that again. And I went back and I saw, so immediately I knew, okay, <laughs> this is where we're going. We're going right here. So we're in Luke 17 and we are in verse number one. We'll conclude in verse number four. And it says here, then said he unto the disciples, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea, then that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And then I'd like to throw in verse number five because I like the disciples' response to this, this even command. They said, Lord, increase our faith. Jesus begins this discourse with his disciples. And he starts with this saying where he says, it is impossible that, the, that offenses will, it is impossible, but that offenses will come but woe unto him through they come. You see, the word offenses, it means scandal or snare. The word in other places in the New Testament is translated as occasion to fall and occasion to stumble. The verse then says it is inevitable that snares or occasions to stumble and fall into sin will come. But be very sure and make sure that you're not the one putting the stumbling block. Be very sure you're not the one setting the trap or the snare for someone else to fall into. Now, why do I say that? Because what I know is this, is that often, especially when, you, when you, you start to talk to the saints, that we hear verses like this, and often our minds begin to travel towards somebody else. And we think about somebody else's offense. And we think about somebody else's issue or problem, or somebody else doing a thing. But we rarely begin to look at ourselves first and recognize what God might be saying to us through the verse. And there is a clear-cut warning here by Jesus that says, make sure you're not the one making, making stumbling blocks for people. Someone might say, hey, well, I mean, I, I, I don't do anything that bad. Well, let, let's just consider the extent of this warning. Verse number two, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these other ones. Now we get a real warning. Now, the theme of this meeting, we put, we're going to put onus on verse number three, in which we will do in time. But the, the real warning right here, the heavy warning right here is in verse number two about making sure you don't offend one of Christ's little ones. Because the warning here is that, look, if it's better for you for you to, 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 to be, have a millstone or a, a heavy talent sized rock placed upon your neck, thrown into the ocean where you know you're not going to come back from that. He said, that's better. That's a real warning then. Like, man, I need to make sure that my steps are circumspect so that I don't offend someone, that I don't cause someone to stumble. 
I don't need to be looking at what somebody else might do to me. I need to look at, I need to make sure I don't do something to somebody else. Jesus gives this warning. And then in connection with that warning, that we take heed not only to ourselves in the matter of forgiveness, but take heed unto ourselves that we don't offend somebody else. Then he gives this wonderful injunction here in verse number three and four. And it says, take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day and seven times in a day, turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. In verse three, the term take heed comes from a Greek word, prosecco. And this word, it means to attend to oneself, to apply oneself to, to devote thought and effort to. So when Christ uses this term, he's telling you that this is something you need to take some thought on and you need to apply yourself that this is something that you will do. I'll illustrate it, I'll illustrate it like this. When, uh, when reading a book, let's say you're reading a book and you find something that is powerful or impactful in the book. What are some things you might do so that you don't forget that point that's there? What, what, you might underline it. You might highlight it. Right. Take a picture of it even. Uh, because you want to you, like this is something that was impactful and powerful and you wanted it to be to be remembered. See, but when you're speaking verbally to someone, can you literally underline a verbal sentence? No. Can you highlight it? No. Or maybe can you? And the way you can. Is by this Greek word prosecco. When Jesus says take heed. He is underlining, he's underlining something for you and me. He is highlighting something for you and for me. And Jesus, being the author of all language, had masterful control over the language he spoke. This phrase is, is, is a verbal highlighter. So anything that he says after this, connected to this take heed, then you know what? My ears need to be so perked. Because I know there is something influential, impactful, and powerful that he's trying to say to me. And in this sense, he tells you what he's trying to say. And what did he say? He said, take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. Verse number four is where the cross gets a little heavy, though. Because if a brother trespasses against me and he says, Lord, please forgive me. Brother, f forgive me for what I've done. All right, yeah, sure. But then he does it again, though. All right, all right. But then he does it again. I'm like, okay, bro. All right, I see where this is going. Then he does it again. And it's like, okay, all right. And, and, and we have to keep the context of the disciples in mind. I'm talking about before the cross. What was one of the things they loved to do? <laughs> they loved to argue. <laughs> but what were they arguing about? Who was going to be the greatest? You know, in Matthew 20, when, 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 when they're there and, 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 and the sons of thunder, James and John, and their mother, they got their mother in on this thing. <laughs> that now they, they come together and, 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 and their, 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 their mother's here trying to, uh, well, Jesus, um, which one of my sons? What about the other 10? But which one of my sons are you going to place on your right and on your left? You see, the, the thing is, is that the context of these brethren is that they knew they were offenders. The conviction of the spirit had rested upon them. They knew what was going on. They knew they had been injured as well. And what Christ was attempting to do was attempting to get them to work reconciliation right now. And I'm telling you, saints, that somebody under the sound of my voice. The Lord is speaking to you, getting you to trying to get you to work some reconciliation as well. 
that there are times where we think we may have forgiven. But have you really forgiven? And we're going to explain that in a second. I'm going to break that down in a little while. But I want that question out there on the docket right now. You think you've forgiven, but have you really forgiven? Nonetheless, the admonition is to take heed to yourselves and to see if you have really worked the work of forgiveness. Now, th there's something that we have to consider before we go any further in this idea of forgiving anybody. There is a foundational thing. It is so rudimentary that you would think I don't even need to bring it up. But I know what I have learned about uh, saints, what I've learned about us is that the rudimentary things is where we often are lacking. That all that deep stuff, we, we can go deep in this and that and the other. But when it comes to first grade Christianity, many of us have failed, but yet and still we're trying to take calculus. So we're going to go to something very foundational that you probably think I shouldn't even have to mention. We're going to mention it anyways, because I know the importance of this thing. If anything else will be worked out in our lives, I know the importance of this thing. And I want us to go to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter three. You know what? I, I, I feel like I shouldn't even begin there. I'm going to begin a few verses earlier. I'm going to go to verse number five. Let's start with verse number five, because there's something I notice here. <laughs> And I, I believe we should consider it as well. Colossians chapter three, beginning at verse number five, it says here, mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience in which ye also walk some time when ye lived in them. Now, let me stop right there. Now, that's a list of some very fleshly things. It talks about fornication and uncleanness and, and, and evil concupiscence. And, and this is what I realized about many of us. I'm not saying you. I, said, I just said many of us in general. What I realized is this, is that many of us, we come to Christ and if you have a history or a, or a past, you come to Christ and the first things that happen in your life is that those major things. I'm talking about the fornication. I'm talking about the evil concupiscence, the idolatry, that those things that when you come to Jesus, those things you're, you're willing to. I got to change that. And you, and you give that up. You change this and you change that. But what I, what I love about what Paul does here, it's like he puts those things in the class of their own. Because notice how verse eight begins. He says, OK, you put that stuff off. But watch what he says in verse number eight. But now ye also put off all of these. Now, wait a minute now. It's almost as if the brother is identifying, OK, you did this work, but this work you have not done. And what I realize about this work here that he's about to go through right now, this is a harder work. This is a difficult work, because at the root of this next part of what he's saying, it's the root of me and you. It's the nature that you and I possess. That's where all of these things, they abide and abound right in the nature of us. Verse number eight. But now you also put off these anger. Wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. In verse number 10. And I've put on the new man. Which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Saints, before we go any further. Only a new man can adorn themselves in all of the characteristics that Paul is about to list. Only a new man. And for you to be considered a new man, there must you must have passed through a few steps. If you're really a new man or a new woman, if you're really new in Jesus, you must have passed through some steps. Not necessarily in this order, 
but these are three steps I know everyone has had or has to pass through if they're a new man in Jesus. The first thing I know you have to pass through is repentance. You must have the experience of feeling sorrow for sin. But repentance is more than this. Repentance also brings a change of mind, a change of thought about your sin, and a subsequent turning away from your sin towards God. That's one thing I do know. We all have had to repent if we're a new man in Jesus. The second thing I know has to happen is that you must experience new birth or regeneration. Repentance leads you to desire something different. New birth or new life is the impartation of the power of God to live the new life which you desire. And then the third thing I know is this, is that you and I have to receive a new heart as well. When we think of the heart, we think of the mind. But that is a limited view of what the Bible means when it uses the term heart. The heart refers to the center and the seat of a person, the control unit of your being. And yes, the control unit of your being is in your mind, but it's more than just simply the mind. It is how you will be able to do. It is the control unit of your whole actions and body and thoughts and feelings and everything else. So what I know is this, is that if I have put on the new man, now, what Paul is about to say in the rest of these verses, I will be empowered to do. I can actually do it. But if I'm still an old man, I will not be able to do it. Saints, you realize that the Bible says that the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. So someone might be struggling with this, this issue of forgiveness, or you might be struggling with any sin in your life. I'm telling you right now that there is no way you can gain victory in any issue in your life if you still are an old man. The old man is going to continue to do what old men do. And to think you can, it, it's, like, it's, like these, the, the, <laughs> it's like these people looking for a spouse. They're looking for a spouse out there and they find somebody that they know that person is in the world. They know they're worldly, but yet still they see, oh, I see all this great potential in them. And then they try to work on them and try to get them to become the type of man or woman they think they can be. That brother or that sister is only going to change when the Lord changes them. That's not your work to do. So what I know is this is that it's the same thing with the old man. You're trying to reform the old man. The old man can't reform. The old man won't reform. The old man is gonna be the old man. If the old man was a proverbial gentleman sitting on a recliner with a stained up white t-shirt on with a hole in it and with a pot belly drinking a beer, that's what the old man will always be. You can't take him and turn him into Something, no, the old man has to die. Amen. And Paul is alluding to this without going into depth. He's letting you know, no, you're new, so the old man is dead. And if the old man is dead and you're new, guess what? Now, let me give you something that you can do now. Verses 11 through 14 say it like this, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And this is the thing, saints. I love what Paul says in verse number 13. 
He says, For, and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave, so also you and I should do. According to verse 13, I don't know if you caught it, but according to verse 13, one must, I repeat, one must understand Christ's forgiveness for them to forgive. The language here is is comparative. It's not contrast. It's comparison. So if it's comparison, then as Christ forgave, you forgive. This means then for me to forgive like Christ, I must know how he forgives. I personally have to be acquainted with the depth of Christ's forgiveness. And for me to really grasp his forgiveness, I must be acquainted with the depths of my sin. I'm going to tell you right now. Someone who is not acquainted with the depths of their sin. I can almost guarantee you that's a self-righteous person. I'm telling you right now, self-righteousness breeds, thrives and survives off of someone who is not acquainted with their own sin. You cannot be self-righteous if you know the depths of your sin and what Christ had to forgive in you. And what I realize is that is that many times as a people, we know the doctrine. But we're falling short at the experience. If someone were to come and audit the seven day Adventist church and audit the church, for their experience, not for the doctrine, but audited the church's experience. Oh, you know, wait a minute, somebody is doing it. It's called the investigative judgment. The church is, is being audited right now. And the thing is, this is that the auditor is not looking for all the doctrines in the right place, though that's what we focus on a lot. No, what he's looking for. He's looking for one thing, and what he's looking for is, is my son's image in you? And the scripture just says that as Christ forgave, so should I. So then how did Christ forgive? Did he forgive partially? Did he forgive almost everything? Did he forgive 93% of what you and I have done? She said, not by works of righteousness which we have done. All right. What did Jesus forgive, saints? He forgave all, okay? That's what he forgave. His forgiveness covers everything that we could have ever done. It covers that. His forgiveness is that is that is that deep and that far and that wide. And I want us to consider this is that you you cannot. You cannot listen to me. You cannot impart this level of forgiveness if you've never received it yourself, you can't. It is impossible. Like you must experience this thing. It must come in and flow in and then flow out because it's not of you. That's why it's flowing out. You have to receive it yourself. And it is only a gift from God that as you understand the doctrine, you believe the doctrine, then you're supposed to experience what the doctrine brings. It's not just, I know this is right. All that is good, but if it ain't touching your heart, saints, you're falling short. I'm falling short. Like, I, I, I don't want just doctrine in my life. Please, Lord, no, please. I need more than that. I need more than teaching. I appreciate sound teaching, but if I'm just going to be a hard hearted fool, I'm all I'm doing is storing more wrath upon me in the day of judgment. 
I always say it like this, that sometimes you don't need to learn more stuff. You need to just practice the stuff that you got. Because you keep learning more stuff. Well, if you don't follow the more stuff that you're learning, guess what's going to happen? It's just adding more gasoline to your eternal fire. Your eternal damnation, excuse me. It's just adding more that you will burn. And this is the thing, saying, this is the thing. This is the thing. That is not how God would have it. He wants us to experience and know. I thought there was somewhere in the pen of inspiration. I know where it is. I'm just being facetious. But I thought there's somewhere in the pen of inspiration where it says that the seal is a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually. That what, what would be the result of that? So that you can not be moved. And saying this issue of forgiveness is a very important one. And you must comb through your life and you must recognize, is there anything I'm harboring from somebody else? And you must get this issue worked out. As a matter of fact, something, something here, I, I, I had to put this in here. This is from Christ Object Lessons, page 251. Just bear with me on this. It says, we are not forgiven because we forgive, but as we forgive, the ground of all forgiveness is found in the unmerited love of God. But by our attitude toward others, we show whether we have made that love our own. Once again, to the point, for you to be able to do it, you got to receive it. And then if you have not, if you're not able to do it, saints, it's letting you know then, I got a kink somewhere in my righteous armor. There's, some, there's something I'm missing. Because if you have really received this thing, then you will be able to do it. And, and why I say this is so important, because this is an issue of our eternal destination. It really is. And I find this in the book of Matthew, Matthew, chapter six. Matthew, chapter six. I want us to notice what something something that is said here in the context of what we're talking about right now. Matthew, chapter six, verse 14 and 15. Notice what it says here. Notice what it says. It says. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. And, and as I was looking at this word forgive, because I, I'm a gentleman, I always look at words, especially when I'm looking at uh, words in the Bible, because there's oftentimes there are, there's depth to the word that's beyond our English language. The English language to me is one of the most limited languages in, in history because you have to use so many different words to describe just one thing. But you go to other languages, even modern languages, but especially biblical languages, they'll use one word and it has so much meaning behind it. But in our English language, we don't have an equivalent and you got to say all kind of other stuff. And it's like, no. Let's get the real meaning of the thing first. So when you think of forgive, what do you think forgive means? I'm asking you a question. What do you think forgive means here? What do you think it means? I'm talking about the literal word, not the idea. What do you think Jesus means by forgive? What, what, what do you think he was trying to portray? Pardon. Pardon? All right. Pardon. That's a good one. Yes. To give something in place of what they've given you. All right. All right. What was that? Let go. Let go. Mercy. It's like you've been looking at my notes. The word forgive. What, what it literally means. We're just dealing with the literal word and then we're going to put it into its context of how after the word, the literal word forgive. It means to let go. That's what it literally means. It means to to let go. It means to bypass. It means to bypass a debt. That's what the word literally means. So in 
at the root of forgiveness or being able to forgive, one must be able to let go. So what does it mean to forgive practically then? To forgive, you have to release. Listen, 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 please. To forgive, you have to release the offender from the emotional responsibility you think they owe you for their offense. That's forgive. To forgive then means that you, you release the offender. Or you, uh, yeah, you, to forgive, you have to release the offender from the emotional responsibility you think they owe you for their offense. And really consider that, because when someone does something to you, there is collateral damage and you carry that collateral damage. In thoughts, in feelings, you carry those things with you. But if you really forgive, as the scripture is talking about here, as Jesus is saying, look, for you to be forgiven, you have to forgive and th that you have to be able to release that person from any obligation that you think they owe you. You say, you know what, that person don't owe me anything. They don't even owe me an apology. And I know that's tough. You mean to tell me somebody can do something that injures me and I have to carry this thing and they can walk scot-free without ever saying they're sorry for this thing? For you to move on and for you to be like Jesus? Yes. What has Jesus done? For, let's just deal with yourself. Forget anything else. Since you accepted Christ, have you been perfect and faithful? No. But do you believe he's forgiven you? Yes. And that's exactly what he wants us to be able to do. You're going to be in church. You're going to be in churches. You're going to be around people. And and, 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 and they may do and say things. One thing I have seen, <laughs> mercy, this is one thing I have seen. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just with the church I have attended or the churches I have seen. But maybe not with the churches you go to. But there is one thing I have seen that makes me marvel. And I, I've seen many division arise from this one source. And you know what that source is? It's the kitchen on Sabbath. I'm telling you, I have seen folk that don't talk to folks still to this day, don't have real relation with folk this day because of what has went on in the kitchen on Sabbath. Why am I bringing that up? I'm bringing it up because, saints, you and I are, are but flesh. And you may understand that for yourself, but, but, but you got to understand that for other people, too. Yes, you, you may recognize, oh, man, I'm weak, I'm frail, I'm this and that. Well, well guess what? They, you're not the only one. Every church, every congregation is full of folk that know the frailties of their own human makeup just like you. And this is why. This is why the Lord is like, look, you got to have grace and you got to have forgiveness for your brothers and sisters in the faith. Why? Because they will continually offend you, you know. Remember how Jesus started in, in, in Luke 17. He says, it, it is impossible, but that offenses should come, meaning it's impossible they're not going to come. But what is the antidote, Jesus? Forgiveness. That's the antidote. That's how you fight it. You let go. You release those people from the offenses. You release them from that emotional responsibility you think they have to you. You let them go from that. That's the antidote. And that's what will bring wonderful joy and life. But, but closing on this thought, I know my time is winding down. I want us to notice what Christ says here in this portion of Scripture. We're in Matthew 6 still. We're in verses 14 and 15. I'm going to read them one more time. And it says here, it says, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not, 
mend their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Now let me ask you a question. Are you going to go into heaven without your trespasses forgiven? Saints, this is a prerequisite for heaven. This is not an option. Just like in the scenario that I presented to you before, an individual working for a, a degree, they can take all the classes that, is, that are focused on their degree and pass them with A's and everything. Everything else is fine, but if they do not take the prerequisite, they will not get the degree. And saints, for you and for me, if we are going to enter into glory, you're gonna to have to take this class. You're gonna to have to make sure you have passed this class. You got to pass this class. And the thing is this is that I know it's difficult. It's hard, like I said, I've walked through this thing before myself. I'll give you a, a, an, an example, a story. I've walked through this thing on multiple occasions, but this is the first time this ever happened to me. I'll close on this. I'll tell a little bit of my business. I just became a Christian, and um, there was a young, a young lady that I was dating before I became a Christian that I, I know the Lord was telling me, man, you need to just go ahead and leave that alone. But I didn't quite leave it alone. Well, anyways, um, I'm still having um, a relationship with a young lady, and not, not like it was, but I, I'm still holding out hope. Why? Because she had so much potential. I gave her all the 27 amazing facts. She had studied everything. And, and, and I'm thinking, oh, man, this, this is it right here, boy. Well, um, it didn't progress no more after that. I'm wanting it to go somewhere. But it wasn't progressing anymore. So, you know, I, we still stayed in contact, but I wasn't as committed to her as I was. But I still had great desire for her and I knew she'd be a great Adventist. I was so, I was so stuck on this thing. Well, after a couple months of not seeing her, she gives me a call one day. <laughs> she gives me a call and she says, I wanna go to church with you. And I'm like, really? So now I'm quickening now. I'm like, amen, I think it's finally working. So I go pick her up, I take her to church with me and she has this wonderful day at church. <laughs> and um, so I'm dropping her off. She spent the whole day with her brother, the whole day with me. And I'm feeling so great. I'm thinking, man, this thing is really rolling now. I mean, it's going to be my wife, so on and so forth. And so now I'm about to drop her off back at her apartment. And uh, she says, well, I have something to tell you. That already don't sound good, right? She says, I got something to tell you. <laughs> I said, all right. Well, and what is it? And but when she said that, I already knew. I already knew where this was going. Like the Holy Spirit already was like, brother, you know where this is going. So she said, I got something to tell you. I said, okay. Well, what is it? I'm pregnant. And I was like, huh? And you should, I mean, the gut punch that was to me, I was devastated. But you know, I couldn't, I couldn't let it out like that. I had to be, you know, I had to be, you know, <laughs> I couldn't just be like, I'm heartbroken, but I am devastated on the inside. And I'm hearing her say this, and, and she's telling me this and then the other. And I'm like, all right, you know, and I just drop her off. Man, I tell you, right after that, I proceed to go through a bitter, a bitter issue of hate. Not only did I hate her, I hated babies. Like, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm sitting in a, in a doctor's office. I saw on TV these children, little babies, and I'm feeling this coming up inside of me. And the Lord was like, brother, you know what you're dealing with, right? You hate her and you hate children. And I knew, I mean, I got a problem, man. I have a problem. Anyways, long story short, I'm dealing with this issue and the, and, and the Lord is working on me. Brother, you got to deal with this. You got to deal with this. I'm, he's working with me. Well, I go to do this, some Bible work and I'm doing Bible work with hate in my heart. And the Lord is like, brother, your efforts will not be blessed while you got this in your heart. So I really begin to pray. I begin to pray and pray and pray. Lord, take this out of me. Take it out of me. I don't want to take it. Get this thing out of me. I know X, Y, and Z, so on and so forth. And I pray for, for months. And then one day I get back from doing the Bible work. I'm at home. And the Holy Spirit's like, 
give her a call. And I'm like, why? But the Lord was like, no, give her a call. I said, okay. So I give her a call. And I'm, I don't know how I'm going to feel. I don't know what's about to happen. But this is what happened. So I call her, and she began to talk to me. And um, I'm, I'm kind of like, how are you doing? I'm kind of like talking to her like that. But then she began to tell me about her birth experience. She was like, oh, man, you know, she, I, I got, she's telling me how she almost died in labor. And all this other, and I remember when she began to tell me this. Man, God is so good. As soon as she began to tell me that, it's like all the animosity just, it's like a wind blew it away. And I began to have care for her, her concerns and for her baby and for her life and for her genuinely. And it was at that moment I knew I didn't forgive, I didn't forgave this girl. I don't harbor those issues no more. And I knew the power of the ability of heaven to make me forgive something that I felt like I could not forgive. And saying somebody here might be dealing with something that you feel like you cannot forgive. You feel like you can't let go of. It's just that deep. I'm telling you, if you approach the throne of grace and you beseech heaven for the ability and the power, I am a living witness. It would flow in you. It will purify you and it will change you. And all those issues will be washed away. And saints, why is it important? Because it is a prerequisite for heaven. With that being said, we're going to pray. We're going to pray that, that we all have that forgiving heart that Christ has and that we forgive as Jesus forgives as well. Let us pray.